Good morning. Good to see everyone. Let's all stand. Let's praise the Lord this morning. Yeah, let's let's all join join in and sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. over here and one over here and be done with it but uh whoo you do a great job and i love it it's just wonderful and it's good to have Lori back playing the piano with us she made it to ohio and all the way to the fingers of michigan uh, ithaca, new ithaca new york oh you did go a long way and then you drove back yeah. oh anyway that's uh part of it but we're glad to have her back on the piano. I do want to also thank, very publicly and online, Brad Wells for playing last week. Wow. He, he, it, was, it was amazing. I mean, he got over there and he just, he did, there is a fountain filled with blood. I heard it. I was impressed. Yeah. Well, very few could be, but I tell you what, he did a great job. Welcome to those of you on the internet. Thank you for joining us. We're glad to have you here, uh, taking part in our worship service at Chestnut Community Church in McKinney, Texas. Thank you for coming. We have several prayer requests today. Pastor Frank 
I haven't heard if he's found a home yet, but uh, I don't know what he's doing, but I know that uh, he had to be out by the first. So keep him in prayer and keep the church, that their little church in prayer because they are they're still working. We've got a mess in here, you notice that, but it's because we had a bad water leak and we tried to patch it instead of fix it. And there's a difference. Uh, you've got to fix it right, and that's what's going on in here now. So just don't fall in a hole. Uh, just stay out of the stay out of the hole there and go on. Uh, we're just so glad to be able to uh, serve. We want to remember a special prayer today for our elders and leadership as we are experiencing change all around us, and uh, that's just part of the way life is. Uh, things happen, and I wrote in here when I got started, I said, oh goodness, I've got to talk about something other than me, uh, because I, folks, I, I, I know, uh, I don't know if you ever heard Red Foley sing, y'all ever know Red Foley? No, he was on, uh, we'd hear him on Saturday night, Grand Ole Opry, as we'd listen to the radio. And he would sing a slow song. Time has made a change in the old home place. Time has made a change in each smiling face. And I know that my friends can clearly see time has made a change in me. So I'm typing this up, and Stephen, my boy, was he came with his girls and wife, and we cooked hamburgers yesterday. Uh, and swam in the pool. Oh, didn't think that ever happened, but we did. We were actually in the water, and uh, he and then he started in on a game that we used to play, and he started singing all the songs he could think of about change and time, and and he did the birds, and he did uh, some other. Uh, uh, I said, "Boy, get out of here! Leave me alone! I got work to do." But uh, we think about that. Change is happening. But there is one thing that doesn't change, and that is the Lord Jesus. He's always been the same, and he didn't start in Bethlehem. He started long before that. We're going to talk about that this morning. And uh, I also want to mention that on the 25th, Pastor Frank is going to muster his people, and they're going to cook lunch for us, and we don't need to embarrass us. We need to just, you know, we'll just do a long-term Bible study or whatever and prayer time. But they want to cook lunch for our church and his church together. And I told him that that'd be fine. I'm always up for lunch. Uh, I don't think I've missed more than three or four my whole days. But we're going to have a good time. And I, I don't know what he's cooking. I'll, I, I think we can probably guess, but... If he makes any of those tamales like they used to make, whoo, that's worth coming. If nothing else, just to get five or ten of them and go out on the street and sell them for two dollars. Boy, they're good. But uh, we're going to be excited uh, to celebrate with them uh, at the end of September. Anyway, anyone here have a special prayer request? Anybody? All across this vast auditorium. Then let's pray together. Father, more than life itself, we want to share our love for you. We want to make sure that we as a family here at this church understand your love and your power and your grace and your mercy and your tender loving care. And, and we want to thank you, Father, for what you have here. For each one in this building, I pray, Father, that today as we sing these glorious hymns and as we look at John 1, we pray that the Spirit of God would rest upon us, that what we do would bring honor to you. Now, Heavenly Father, open our hearts in song that we can worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's all stand again. We're going to sing, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Let's continue to sing about his birth. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweet as that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in glory sing how they hand to things.
Father, just thank you for this time. We can sing about your wonderful name of Jesus, Lord. Just continue to work through our hearts and and just be with the congregation as we continue to dig into your word, sing your praises, and and share your great name. Be with Brother Ricky as he brings a message. Please forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. In the 1500s, Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic priest. He had all the training that the church could give him. He knew about several different denominations, but I'm not sure he knew about the world religions, though there are There are at least six that we're going to look at today. Christianity, Judaism, Confucianism, Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism. And I want you to pay close attention because the next couple of slides are going to give you an idea of the worldwide impact of these world religions, each one of them. Uh, in a different level, scattered all over the world. Now, you can see here, you can't read the little uh, chart on the side, but I'll interpret this map for you. You see all of the Americas, north and south. You'll see most of Russia up there. You'll see Australia and the southern part of Africa are all pretty much Christian to some degree. Many of those in South Africa are tribal, but they are monotheistic. They have their own little grouping. Clearly, there are many different divisions. In South America, they were all Catholic Christians. North America, Canada, all of that area up there that you see in the purple. The green is Islam. The red up in top where you see the light purple and the darker purple, that red up in there, uh, that's Buddhism. You can see a little bit over in Japan, the little islands. Those are primarily Hindu, uh, but the big Hindu is down in India, where Mahatma Gandhi uh, has done what he does. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but Buddhism is a faith that was established about 2,500 years ago. Uh, Siddhartha Gautama, and I apologize, Mr. Buddha, I, well, like you can hear me, um, I said that wrong, but he was the original Buddha. And here's what he did. He sat down and wrote out some precepts. Now, I have learned a lot more about Buddhism than I ever wanted to because the the, uh, chair of religion at Austin College has decided she's going to be Buddhist. And I thought, huh. I'll bet there's some Presbyterians around this world that are flipping over upside down over that. But that's the way it is. So he died around 483 B.C. 
when he died, all the followers of his wisdom decided they would gather all of his messages and all of his thoughts, put them into some books, and they did. And they have a thing called Dharma, which means uh, wisdom, kindness, and patience. And those are great attributes. Wonderful. You need to have wisdom. You need to have patience. You need to have kindness, generosity, and compassion. Uh, they had five moral precepts. You ready? Do not kill living things. Do not take what is not given. Do not have sexual misconduct. Do not lie. And don't use drugs or alcohol. Those are pretty good rules. They, they, in fact, you can live a pretty good life just holding those things together. They had four noble truths. There's a truth about suffering. There's a truth about the cause of suffering. There's the truth about the end of suffering. And the path of truth will free you from all suffering. That's what Buddha taught. And the more he taught that, the more people decided they would just kind of hang on. They liked what he said. In fact, there are nearly 400 million Buddhists, according to Christianity today, in the world. That's a lot. They had an eightfold path. If you follow the eightfold path, you will come to what they call the afterlife, which is the wheel of existence. Now, this is what they teach. 400 million people are hearing this. I don't know if they go to church on Sunday, but... What they do when they go to their lessons, that's what they hear. I'm going to take this straight out of their book. You will be born an infinite number of times until you achieve the state known as nirvana. Once that's achieved, you'll be fully enlightened. And you can choose to be reborn and help others on their journey while others believe that the cycle ends and since there's no permanent soul or self, all existence ends. That's kind of depressing. So I did an internet search. How many people have been to Nirvana and can come back and testify to it? Guess how many hits I had? None. They haven't been to Nirvana. You know why? It's like going to the, the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. There is no Starship Enterprise. And this is a concept. Hinduism in India. Oh, my, my, my. Hindu. Uh, they are not so much a um, religion as they are a system of thought. And their system of thought is something like this. If, in fact, you recognize that you are a part of a larger group of people, then you have wisdom of thought. They have a holy book, or about six of them. They're called the Vedas. The Bhagavad Vida, or Veda, is the one that is most likely to be quoted but they don't have a founder. They just decided, hey, let's adopt this system, and behold, that's what came up. Uh, Hinduism has almost a billion followers. One billion. So you got the Buddhists, you got the Hindu. One is written and established upon a man who died in 483. <clears throat> One of them about a system of people they say that Hinduism is the oldest religion, but that only goes back 4,000 years. I think they need to consider Egypt. Egypt had gods all over the place back in the days of Moses and others. But uh, what's the concept of Hindu about eternal life? Well, they claim that you are also reincarnated that you come and go and you just continue like that. So if you're good in this life, you may come back as a, a holy cow. 
if you're bad in life, you may come back as a goat. I'm just making fun. You know why? Because they deserve it. They deserve comedy. Buddha, Hindu, Confucius, 6th century before Christ, back in China. Uh, Confucius was a very smart man. In fact, he wrote several books, and as he wrote the books, it contained his wisdom. And he had a lot of wisdom, there's no doubt. He had a lot of things going for him. But you know, the biggest thing about uh, Confucianism is that most of the time you could gain some benefit by honoring the past. You know why? You have no future. You have no future. Confucius would be one who would say that when we die, we're blown out like a candle in the wind. Islam, second largest religion in the world. 1.8 billion Muslims worldwide as of the last counting. And they're increasing. I had a privilege of visiting with Wilma McFatridge. Uh, you probably don't know her. You may have heard of her father-in-law, uh, Carl McFatridge, who had Carl's Tasty Sausage back in the day. Made up here in White Ride, Texas. Uh, her husband, Bill, baptized me when I was in Josephine, Texas. Uh, he baptized me. Uh, his wife, Wilma, whom I visited in the hospital, uh, tried to teach me to play piano. Well, that didn't work. And I'll tell you why. I had to leave school on Tuesdays, go home and shower, and then walk down to the preacher's house while all my friends are out here practicing football. And I had to learn to play the piano. Do, re, mi, willy, one, John. I, I, I don't do piano in public just like I don't do math. She said, you know, I think you believe this, but I want to ask you anyway. I said, okay. She said, why is the United States not listed in Revelation? I said, the answer is simple. We're a non-entity. Well, let that soak in for a minute. Fastest growing religion in the United States is what, class? Islam. In the United States of America, the fastest growing religion Religion is Islam. And you sit back and you scratch your head and you wonder. They have a holy book. It's called the Quran. They have a guy named Muhammad. Uh, the word Islam means the will of submission to the will of God. And you sit back and you have to scratch your head. Because in 570 A.D., Muslims believe that Muhammad, born in Mecca, in Saudi Arabia was the final prophet sent by God and the only one to whom we should surrender. Well, there it is. I guess that's about everything you need to know. I guess if you follow one of those traditions, you can just go home. Or you can open your Bible. Ha <laughs> ha! Open your Bible to John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Now back up 14 chapters to John chapter 1. And here's what you're going to read. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now the beginning doesn't mean the manger. 
It doesn't mean the Christmas story. In the beginning was the Word. And it's important for you to get the concept here because this is one of the first messages I preach generally in any revival service I have. That in the beginning was the Word, and we're going to concentrate. Buddha, now, now you, you may go home and think, boy, he was really butchering the world religions. Yes. And you know why? It's not out of disrespect. It's out of deep respect for the one I follow. For Jesus himself was the Word from the beginning, John has a purpose for writing his book. He says, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life through his name. So here is the sovereign glory and majesty of Jesus himself in the beginning. Now the beginning doesn't mean the manger. I just told you that. If I were to give you a test, could you answer that question? Is the beginning Bethlehem? What's your answer? No. Good. Ah, we're getting there. I think we're going to make it. You're right. The beginning goes all the way back to the beginning. There was a day when there was nothing except the Godhead. Nothing except the Godhead. And then everything else started to take a place. He's not talking about a start. He's talking about a state. He was in the beginning with God. Mark that down. Jesus Christ is God. He's nothing. He, he is beyond every other religion because all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. When God started to express himself, he expressed himself as a word. Do you know um, the word, I want to get this right, is an expression of invisible thought. I'm thinking of a mammal. Great old big huge, massive head, lives in the water, little short stubby feet. What kind of mammal am I thinking about? Huh? Look at that. You're two for two. The expression of my thought is made by the word hippopotamus. The expression of the thought of God is seen in Jesus Christ and in He alone. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Now, there are many who will go door to door in this city. They do in mine up in Sherman. And they'll try to tell us that they are the witnesses of Jehovah. They don't even understand the word Jehovah. And I know this because I've got them. They come in my office every week just to see who's in the hospital. And I'll sit down and talk to them. But I want you to know John is telling us that in the beginning, before there was any earth or sun or moon or stars, before there was any creation or cosmos, he was already there. And he was not called Jehovah in the Hebrew. The name is Elohim. And in Hebrew, there are three different uh, parallel of, I don't even know what the part of speech is, but in English, we have the singular and the plural, right? I, me, you, or we. We have two. What is that called? The, I can't do, 
grammar in public either. <laughs> huh? I don't know. Okay, as long as we're all together. But in Hebrew, there are three of those. There's singular, there's dual, and there's plural in the Hebrew language. And in Genesis chapter 1, we find, And God said, and Elohim said, Let us make man in our own image. And the word us is not singular, nor is it dual. It's plural, meaning three or more. When God spoke, let us make man in our own image. He was talking to the Holy Spirit and he was talking to the Son. They were all together. You'll say, well, that makes you kind of polytheistic. No, it doesn't. One plus one plus one equals three. You're right. But one times one times one is one. And what they do, what the Godhead does, it brings together the fullness of everything God is. And that's the only math I'm allowed to do. Because I've got that one down. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit were together in the beginning. And the Word was in the beginning. And the Word was there. Fundamentally, Jesus is God. All things were made by Him. Not anything was made that was not made. And we look at it and we can understand it because we have one who has been there and is coming back. Think about how this world is made, folks. Uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of hung up on this James Webb telescope. It is so funny to watch as these pictures are coming back and these scientists are going crazy because they're starting to realize that there is intelligent design, not a big bang. God has designed this entire space, and I just love it. And when I was living up at Sadler, pastoring a little church there, I went to Cook County College. They had a big planetarium. And I took a class in that planetarium. And it was so wonderful to be able to look out at the stars. We used to go out and I, we could do this just here in Collin County. We could see the Milky Way in the summer. We can't see it now because the lights are too bright. But we could actually see. It was so dark out where we lived. You could see the Milky Way in the summer. And I wondered if I go to that one. What's beyond it? And in the winters, I watched Orion as he rose. And I see up here bright red Betelgeuse. And I see down over here Rigel, the great uh, blue star. And then I see the belt. And I see the sword. And I look at that dynamic constellation. I actually drew a map of where those stars are. And they're scattered like you couldn't imagine but they form a constellation called Orion. And you look up at it in the, in the wintertime and you can watch Orion as he chases across the sky. He's a the hunter. Oh, I was amazed with that. And I thought, how smart of God to put pictures in the sky. Uh, we have the Big Dipper. Uh, we have the Little Dipper. When I was down in Australia, we could see the Southern Cross. It's not as fantastic as the Big Dipper, but we could see it. And I was amazed. And you can sit back and look, but this James Webb telescope is seeing things. If, if our physics is correct, and light travels at 186,000 miles a second, give or take a mile or two, in a year, it can travel six billion year, six million years. That's how far it can go in a year. Six million miles is what I'm trying to say. And you sit back and you look at the black velvet of the night, 
and you see the dynamic sprinkle of stars and it just thrills your soul to think that behind all of this is God, the Creator, and His Son, Jesus Christ. All things were made by Him and not anything was made that not anything is made that wasn't made by him. I want to give you some other verses. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. I want you to listen. But of the Son, of Jesus, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. Under the sun, he says, thy throne, O God, is forever. How long did Buddha live? Just a sprinkle of time. How long did Confucius live? Just a snap of the finger in time. How long did Muhammad live? Just a short period of time. How long did Jesus live? Forever and ever. He is Jesus Christ forever and ever. Look at Titus chapter 2. Waiting for our blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You hear it? The great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who is this? Which other religion can say that, even in their holy writings? The Koran does not say Muhammad is eternal. The Koran tries to force eternity on Allah, but that's not what he's called, even in their, uh, their version of the Old Testament. And you sit back and you look at it and you think, how can these other religions know anything when the Word of God tells us this? Look in John. Chapter 20, Thomas answered him, talking to Jesus, My Lord and my God. He confessed him as Lord. He acknowledged him as God. When? At the, after the resurrection. And after Thomas had looked at the nails in his hands and the spear in his side, when Thomas saw that, he was ecstatic because earlier he had said, you know, until I put my hand in that nail that I saw in his hand, I saw the nail. Until I see the pierced rib in his side, I'm not going to believe. And Jesus appeared to them, and here's what Jesus said, Thomas, you're up. Come up here. Thomas, come on, come on, come on. Don't be ashamed. He pulled up his robe. He said, Thomas, put your hand. Put your hand in the nail print, Thomas. He pulled his robe back and he said, Thomas, look where they pierced me. Look at it. And Thomas, I think, fell to his knees, his eyes just overflowing with tears. And he said, my Lord and my God. And the great testimony of that moment is that a human being recognized the absolute humanity and deity of the God-man, Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 and verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt means tabernacled. It means pitched your tent. He came and lived among us. He dwelt among us. We have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. There's a verse, John chapter 1, verse 18. <coughs> no, one. <coughs> no one 
has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. What in the world does that mean? There is a word here called he. Uh, let's see, no other has seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. Here it is. He has made him known. That is a parenthesis type word from a word called exegete. Ex meaning out of, jeet meaning gnosis, gnosis uh, exa. Out of knowledge, Jesus exegeted God the Father to us. Jesus is the image of the firstborn, is the image of God. Jesus is the firstborn from, res from the resurrection. Jesus is the one who describes and visualizes God the Father for us. Us. He has exegeted him. And that word translated into the flesh, oh, it's, this is so pretty. Because Jesus was able to come as a man without discarding deity and without distorting humanity. When he came, he was very much God of God. He laid down that ability and he took up human flesh. And we preached a whole message on this one concept, kenosis out of Philippians, where it says he is the God-man. He's the God-man. He did not discard the deity. He did not distort humanity. What he did was come as God-man. He's not all God. And here it is. The Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory, glory as of the only Son of God, only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He was not all God and no man. That's not what he was. He was not all man and no God. That's not what he was. He was not half man and half God. And this is where you have to get your brain locked in. He was all God and all man. He was the God man. There's never been another like him. There will never be another like him. He is the only one who can dis can can embrace deity and enhance humanity. He's the only one who can come and let you know who he is. He became flesh. He dwelt among us. Why did he have to do that? Well, it's pretty easy. The mystery is not a little baby in swaddling clothes. The mystery is right here in Timothy where it says, Great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. This is three sermons. He was manifested in the flesh. He was vindicated by the Spirit. He was seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up into glory. That's who Jesus is, not who Jesus was. That's who he is. And that is an imperfect participle, an imperfect word. That means it is now and it will continue to be forever. You can't say that of Confucius. You can't say that about the philosophy of Hindu. You can't say that about the moral teachings of the Buddha. You can't do that even with Judaism which is one of the major world religions, uh, kind of a distant cousin. He's one of those 
Judaism is kind of like that cousin that you didn't know about till you win the lottery. You know how those people are. They come out of the woodwork, I'm telling you. Not that I've won the lottery. But uh, you got to play to win, right? The Word of God was made flesh. Let's go back to John 1, 14. The Word of God was made flesh and tabernacled among us. He lived among us. That's who he was. And you know something? If you saw Jesus Christ, you would absolutely not think he was the Savior of the world. Now, if you go to a football practice and you see the football players just in their T-shirt and shorts and shoes, I think you could pretty much tell who Tom Brady is. You can look and see because of the physical stature. You go to a basketball game. You can see the bigs and the almost bigs. I would call them littles, but I'm the little. Okay, so I'm way down here, and they can stair step up. But the Bible says very clearly in the book of Isaiah, when we see him, there is no form, nor comeliness, nor beauty that we should desire him. If you came across the tabernacle in the desert, you would think, my, what an ugly-looking building. What an ugly-looking tent. And the reason you'd say that, even though it was pretty big, it was covered with badger skin on the outside. Ugly, rough, nasty. But you go inside, and there's something there that is amazing. You walk inside, and you see a lampstand. That's the only light inside that tabernacle. But you see the crimson and the blues. And you see the, uh, the shimmering silks that are all inside that tabernacle. And you see the Ark of the Covenant that's there in that holy place of the tabernacle. You see uh, the showbread. You see a laver. And it's all glistening gold. And you look inside it, and, and it blows your mind. If you have an opportunity, look at some of the pictures, the first pictures they took of King Tut's tomb. On the outside, just nothing but old, ugly rock. On the inside, where King Tut was buried, there was gold and silver and precious stones all around that tomb. And all around that tomb, when they shined their lights on it, it just started to sparkle. It was beautiful. When we see Jesus walking down the street, He has no form nor comeliness that we should desire Him. But those of you who know Him, who understand what's inside Him, you see the beauty of majesty because He, very God of very God, has shown himself to the world. Great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh. Here's what the whole verse of 1 Timothy 3, 16 says. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. Hang on to this. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up into glory. You say, we've already read that. Yes, we have, but you need to hear it again. And the reason you need to hear it again is because Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, raised in Nazareth, presented at a baptism in an old muddy Jordan River, Three years he ministered on this earth and then he was tried and convicted and nailed to a cross. That's manifesting in the flesh. That's who he is. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For our sake, he, God, 
made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, Jesus, we might become what? The righteousness of God in him. This is why God manifested in the flesh is so important. When Jesus came, I'm going to credit Adrian Rogers here. I heard this many, many years ago. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. That's the great tragedy. He came to his own. He came to the Jews. And they said, no, we don't want you. We don't want you. Probably the greatest mental anguish you can go through is to have people tell you, we don't need you. You just go on, leave. We don't want you. The greatest agony of a family, of a husband or a wife, is when the other partner says, why don't you just move out? I don't need you anymore. Look at the tragedy. But then there was a transaction. <laughs> as many as received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's the great transaction. Here's the great transformation. You were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Let me break that down a little bit clearer for you. Nice, blue, beautiful side. When you sit back and look at it, you were not born of blood. Now, you were, but not spiritually. You are not born of blood, not by natural generation. Nor are you born by the will of the flesh. Nor are you born by the will of man. When you come to Jesus, you are born again by God. You've got to work your way through Buddhism. You've got to work your way through Hinduism. You've got to work your way through Islam and Judaism and Confucianism. You've got to work your way through them. Men and women, I'm here to tell you, you are saved today through Christ alone. Nothing else. It's only through Jesus Christ that you come. Only come to Him when you decide to come to Jesus, you pray a simple prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know you died for me. And I want to put my life and my faith and my trust in you. Oh, Lord Jesus, I trust you now. And I want you to come. Whether you're on the internet or here in the building, you come just as you are. Would you stand with me as we sing the words on the screen? Here we go. Come just as you are. Come on. Hear the Spirit call. Come just as you are. Come and see. Come receive. Come and live forever, life everlasting, and strength for today. Taste the living water, and never thirst again. Come. Just as you are, hear the Spirit call. Come just as you are, come receive.
Christ the King, come and live forever. And Lord, in heaven, if anyone wants to be saved today, they can trust you. If they want to know full life and they want to know the joy of eternity, they can come to you. And Lord, as we're dismissed now, I pray that we go out and tell the story of Jesus. Let them know how much He loves them. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.